<laughs> so hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out in this ridiculously cold weather. And thank you for stepping away from your personal technology devices uh, long enough to come out and discuss uh, technology addiction. Um, I'm Heather Chaplin. I'm director of the Journalism and Design Program here at the New School. Uh, and I just want to say a few very quick words before uh, handing the evening over to Nick Thompson at the far end, who's the editor of Wired Magazine and will be our host for the evening. Um, back in an earlier version of my life, uh, in the early and mid-2000s, I used to cover the video game industry as a reporter. And I remember the first time I heard a conversation about the ethics of design, the ways in which designers can manipulate users into behaviors that may or may not be in their own best interests. For a game designer to say his game is addictive is the highest praise you can give him. If a player gets hooked and he can't walk away, even if he kind of wants to, you know you've done your job, which begins to get into some pretty weird territory. I remember listening to the conversation and thinking, gee, what would happen if everyone was as engaged with their personal technology as gamers are? Cut to, we all have supercomputers in our pockets. And the last few months, we've been inundated with stories about potentially negative effects of technology. We've heard from technologists and investors at Apple, Facebook, Google, YouTube, questioning just what they've unleashed. Over the weekend, we had a story about YouTube, algorithms promoting extreme and divisive videos. One venture capitalist was quoted as saying that Facebook was ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. So to look at these issues, we've put together a pretty extraordinary panel. Um, and as stellar as the original panel was, we actually have a few additional guests that I just want to mention. We have Roger McNamee in the uh, tie with the pink elephants, bunnies. Bunnies <laughs> with the pink elephants, who uh, yesterday announced uh, that he's uh, with a group of other people launching the Center for Humane Technology. And we're hoping to be joined by uh, Tristan Harris, his partner in this, who is doing an interview and in a car as we speak on his way down here. So hopefully he'll sneak in in time to join this, to join us. Um, and other than that, with only a last word to thank the Knight Foundation, uh, our funder, and Kimberly Lightbody for organizing this event, I hand the evening over to Nick. Great. Uh, thank you very much. So first off, I'd like to say if the fabric of society has been torn apart, I am very impressed that we have a completely full room on a Monday night to talk about deep tech stuff. So even if this panel is complete done, I can't get them to say anything, I think this is great. So. Uh, <laughs> Thank you all for um, showing up. Um, I'm going to ask them questions for, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes, and then we're going to have Q&A. Microphones will be over there. Um, please tweet and Facebook relentlessly, but only about this and do not be distracted. OK. Um, my panel, this is Alexis Lloyd. She runs design at Axios. Before that, she ran the R&D lab at the New York Times, so she knows a lot about this. Um, this is Roger McNamee. He helped fund and start and advise and some of it's a little company called Facebook, um, which has grown into a big company now, and he has had some questions about it recently. He also is in a band called Moon Alice, and he has helped found the Center for Humane Technology. Welcome, Roger. <laughs> this is James Williams. He is one of the uh, founders of Time Well Spent. He is also a, working at Oxford, and he is the author of a book that's coming out called Stand Out of Our Light. He also has a three-week-old baby, which means that he is for the first time having to deal with children demanding use of technology. So, <laughs> we have Nir Eyal, who is an author and a speaker. His first book was called Hooked, about how devices suck us in. And he's working on a new book about how not to get sucked into your devices. So we have an amazing panel. This panel rocks. <laughs> so let's see if we can get them going. So let's start with Nir at the end of the table. Um, explain this whole issue of technology to form habit-forming technologies for good and for ill. Set it up, and let's fight. Okay. So when I got to Silicon Valley, uh, circa 2008, companies had a massive problem. And that problem was that there was lots of technology, and nobody was using it. That a lot of the products that people were building that 
did amazing things technologically speaking, right, and utilized all this amazing infrastructure that had been laid down, had a problem when that people, when they got it into their hands, wouldn't actually do it. And if you think about most of the technology that you use every day, the office software that your employer forces you to use, uh, government, uh, you know, interacting with local government services, interacting with your local business, these products don't suck you in, not in the way Facebook and Twitter and Instagram might suck you in. No, no, no. These products just plain old suck. <laughs> so my, my charge, my mission when I got to Silicon Valley was to figure out what differentiated these products that became things that people wanted to use and ones that people discarded and never used. And so what I focused on was to try and understand what it was, what's the pattern behind some of the world's stickiest products and services. And so that's where I spent uh, years of research talking to the people who built these products, talking to researchers to explain the, the psychology behind these products. And the goal was to help all of us, right, to help the kind of people who are building products and services online to help people do the things they want to do, but for lack of good product design, don't do. I never wrote my book for Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or any of them. They don't need this book. They were the archetypes that I used to explain how the psychology of engaging products work. So it turns out, what is the engaging, what is this underlying psychology? It turns out there are several patterns that you walk through in the uh, flow of these products that utilize many psychological hacks, so to speak. Uh, these same psychological hacks exist outside of technology, it's just that these products use them in a new innovative way in the time. Things like variable rewards, all right? The fact that when you scroll a feed on Facebook, scrolling that feed and searching and searching for that next interesting piece of content uses the exact same psychology as pulling on a slot machine. It's both intermittent reinforcement. By the way, we're speaking in a journalism program, it's the same thing that makes a story worth reading, right? You wanna make it engaging, make it interesting, make a mystery so that the reader gets to the end of your story. It's what makes for a great novel, a great television show. It, it's what make romance romancing. It's why you watch the Super Bowl till the very end was because you didn't know what was going to happen. So what I wanted to do was try and use these same tactics for good. And so the clients I work with, the, the audience for my book, was for people who are building the kind of products to help people exercise more and save money and be more productive at work and connect with friends and family by explaining how they can use these same tactics from these big companies. I didn't call the book How to Build Addictive Products. The book is called <laughs> Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products because there's a big difference between addiction and habits. Habits are behaviors done with little or no conscious thought. We have good habits, we have bad habits. Addictions are always bad. We use that word a lot, everything's addictive. If I like something, it's addictive. If I use it a lot, it's addictive. That's not really the right way to use that term. And addiction is immoral. Uh, creating products that are addictive is immoral because addictions are behaviors that even when people want to stop doing, they can't, right? This is a medical condition. This is not just, ooh, I like to you know, mess around on Facebook for 30 minutes a day. So that's a little bit about, I hope that was a decent introduction. That was an excellent introduction and it leads right into James, which is you, um have watched some of these habit-forming technologies at some of these large companies, and I believe you do not think they've entirely been used for good, and I'm hoping you can explain that position. Yeah, so, um, so I mean, my whole life I've always believed in the potential of technology, and through my university experience, uh, through the years when I was working at Google um, and the search advertising systems there, and you know, what I, what I realized at one point when I was working there is that um, this thing that we call the internet, this kind of informational environment that we all live and breathe in every day, is, is sort of the product of kind of three, three commingling trends. One is the persuasion industry that came to maturation during the 20th century, which drew on advanced knowledge of human psychology to learn how to not just give us information, but uh, shape our behaviors and our attitudes. Uh, the other was um, this new infrastructure we had of measurement, experimentation, uh, message delivery, optimization uh, on the internet, which uh, closed the feedback loop uh, of measurement, so to speak, um, and, and enabled the persuasion industry to sort of uh, colonize this new realm. And then when smartphones became uh, widely prevalent, I think you know what happened was that we sort of became ensconced in this de facto environment of industrialized persuasion. Um, and to me, if technology is for anything, uh, if there's a purpose for it, for these information technologies we use, it's to help us navigate our lives in the ways we want them to go. And I felt that you know, the goals of the technologies I was using every day 
in this uh, persuasion industry, which all the technologies were just relentlessly competing to capture and exploit my attention, um, they, they were optimizing for these lower level metrics, these petty goals, you know, uh, engagement metrics as they're often called, um, time spent, time on site, number of clicks, number of views. You know, nobody has these goals for themselves. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, how much time can I possibly spend on social media today? Does anyone here have, actually have that goal? I'd love to meet somebody at some point who has this goal and understand their mind. Um, but it made me realize that, that there is, uh, there's a fundamental moral and political problem we have now that we all live in this technological environment, uh, this attention economy, where all of these products, all of these services are competing to, to capture and keep and exploit our attention. Um, and when you look at the persuasive power and the, uh, the degree of power uh, compared to, you know, technologies, uh, you know, more traditional media, it's there's no comparison. And when you uh, look at the centralization uh, of these tech, of, of the power to persuade people's thoughts and behaviors, you know, Facebook has over two billion users. That's more people than the number of people who speak English on planet Earth today. Um, I, I think I, I, I came to realize that this is this is the 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 moral and political uh, problem of our time. Because in order to give attention to anything that matters, whether it's climate change or combating extremism or anything, uh, you know, we have to give, be able to give attention to what matters. And I think that's exactly what I saw that these technologies were undermining uh, using these various kind of petty tricks of hacking our reward pathways, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, that's what I've been studying for the last several years at the University of Oxford. And it's what my the, the force of my uh, my work at the moment is is uh, orient, orientated so toward fighting. Sticking on the force of your work for a second, if the problem is these infinitely powerful companies using their incredible persuasive technology to push us towards low-level goals of attention and clicks, is your ambition to reduce their power, or your is your ambition to get them to use their infinite capabilities to push us towards high-level goals? Well, those two things aren't mutually exclusive. Um, I think I'm, I'm for uh, bringing us out of this situation of attentional serfdom that we live in every day, uh, regardless of what, you know, what that looks like in terms of the logistics of it. Um, there, I think there are many routes to the top of the mountain here, uh, and um, you know, as long as we can find one of them, I think that's, that'll be a good thing. So um, due to your good graces, you helped create the largest behemoth you were one of the early founder, founders of or funders of Facebook, and you introduced Mark Zuckerberg to Sheryl Sandberg. Why don't you uh, explain to the room the moment you thought, oh, shit. So by the way, pause for a second. This is Tristan Harris. Um, uh, Tristan worked at Google. He wrote a memo about addictive design that went hugely viral. Then he left, and he has founded several thousand organizations and said several thousand wonderful things and been profile of all places and is working on great stuff uh, and is awesome. So hi, Tristan. How are you? Good to see you. And he's Roger on the um, Center for Humane Technology, which you may have read about in yesterday's New York Times. So, Roger, back to your revelation. Hi, I'm Roger. I'm a Facebook addict. <laughs> You're supposed to say hi, Roger. <laughs> So imagine this, uh, in 2006, Facebook is two years old, Mark Zuckerberg is 22, I'm 50, one of his people brings him in to see me and says, my boss has an existential problem and he needs somebody who's not conflicted to help him solve it. He walks into my office, I said, dude, I've never met you before, I gotta, you gotta give me two minutes to tell you some things. I explained to him that if it hadn't already happened, either Microsoft or Yahoo was going to try to buy the company for a billion dollars, and everybody he knew was going to tell him to take the money, and they'd back his next thing, blah, 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 blah. And I said, I thought he'd created the coolest company since Google, and that the fact they had real identity and gave the user control of privacy was going to really matter to adults, and that while at that time he was only doing it with college kids, it was really going to be incredibly valuable to adults who have way less time. And I said, I don't think you should sell the company. What ensued was five minutes of dead silence with him pantomiming all of these like thinker poses. And I'm sitting there white knuckling, right? I'm literally dying because five minutes of silence with a guy going is the most painful thing on earth. And I'm just not capable of handling it. At the end of the five minutes, he goes, you just won't believe this, but everything you said is true. And I have the contract in my bag and that's what I'm here to talk to you about. 
So I helped him break the deal. I later introduced him to Cheryl. So the four years in between, I was one of his mentors. I was more proud of Facebook than anything I'd ever done. And then at the beginning of the Democratic primary in 2016, I saw some memes being spread uh, that you couldn't explain organically. I know a lot about how Facebook works. I built a band on it. And over the next six months, I saw a whole bunch of things. People scraping Facebook to sell data to police departments about interest in Black Lives Matter. I saw Brexit, where it was really clear that Facebook conveyed an advantage to negative emotional messages over neutral ones. I saw people getting busted for um, violating the Fair Housing Act using Facebook's advertising tools. And I finally wrote Mark and Cheryl, well, I wrote an op-ed, and instead of publishing it, I sent it to Mark and Cheryl. And I said, guys, I think there's a systemic problem here. And I gave them seven examples, only one of which was election-related, because I thought Clinton was going to win, and I didn't want them to dismiss the thing as not an issue if she did. And they treat it like a PR problem, not like a substantive problem. So I spent four months trying to persuade them that this was substantive, and it, it didn't work. And then a few months later, I'm interviewing this dude on on uh, Bloomberg, it happened to be Tristan, who had just been on 60 Minutes, and he's talking about brain hacking. And all of a sudden, the piece that I was missing, which was the business model that Facebook created after I left, suddenly I understood what was going on. I understood why it was you have people, you know, on one side who, like, believe the climate is not changing and people on the other side who believe that contrails are a huge conspiracy or that vaccinations are the end of the world, you know, a, roughly a third of the population of America believes things that are demonstrably not true. And, you know, it's not because of Facebook. People have always believed things that are demonstrably not true. But what has happened is Facebook created a business model that essentially was more made people who believe that kind of stuff more valuable. So it was in their interest to appeal to emotions like fear and anger and to cluster people in tight groups for advertisers. And it turned out that those advertisers could influence the thought processes of the people, implant ideas in their head, make them more extreme over time, and effectively manipulate their thoughts. And I thought to myself, that's not good. I have to do something about this. So I called him up. I said, you need a wingman? He said, yeah, I do. I wear a suit, not very often. I hadn't worn one in years until we started this back in April. But now I have to wear one a lot because we go visit people in Congress and we visit people in New York who are, shall we say, rather more formal. Um, but what I'm here to say is that these folks are the actual professionals. I'm a person who's here because I happen to be involved with Facebook at a moment in time that gives me real credibility to say, this is the most important thing I've ever done, and it scares the hell out of me. Not because they're bad people, not because they intended to do any of this stuff, but rather because the system got out of control and the profit motive makes it really hard to fix. There are solutions. We could go to a subscription model. There are other solutions. They could open up and let the investigators understand what happened in 2016. They could contact everybody who was touched and say, hey, we're Americans. You may like how the election turned out in 2016, but this next time, everybody and their grandmother is going to do this, and you may not like the outcome. As Americans, the best way to fix this is for us to vote, because voter suppression is the goal of these manipulations, and we can beat it by voting. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Does this one work better than the last one? Yeah. All right. Um, cool. I'll go do all my introductions again now. Um, Alexis, let's take it back a step and let's talk about your work a little bit. So at Axios, presumably you have studied the way Facebook pulls us in, the way Facebook may or may not addict us, depending on how you want to use that word. But how do you use all of those tools for your benefit to get people to read more of these stories? Explain that. And why don't you use this lovely microphone? Yeah, I'm going to steal your mic from you. Um, so I'm coming at this, I've come at this from kind of two different sides of the fence. So um, before Axios, I was uh, working in the R&D lab at the New York Times and coming at it from a much more kind of theoretical standpoint, more speculative standpoint, where we were really looking three to five years out and trying to understand how emerging technologies might lead to new kinds of media and information experiences for people. And so a lot of that was looking at not only like what could be made, but what should be made. 
and also what was probably going to be made that shouldn't be made and how do we avoid having to get entrapped in those cycles. Um, and then moving over to Axios, really um, looking at how do you put that into practice for an audience on a day-to-day -day basis. And the first two words in our kind of manifesto are reader first. And that was the thing that really made me come over to Axios because in thinking about all these questions about um, how do you use technology, how do you use it for good, what are the things you should make with it, a lot of those questions come back to making something that really solves a problem, a real problem for your user. And um, the three questions that all of this really cir circles around are what are the capabilities of the technology, what problem are you trying to solve, and how do you know if it worked, how do you know if you've won. Um, and I think that that's something that we think through a lot is kind of how do we solve real problems for our readers in terms of how they get and understand uh, factual, trustworthy information in a landscape where there is so much competing for their attention, including things that are not fact-based, as you mentioned. Um, and how do we do that in a way that really respects their time and attention, which often means spending less time with us. Um, and so I think that when you look at the ways that technology has become addictive in a negative way, it tends to be because they're not really solving a problem for, for you and me and your everyday users of those technologies. And that's either because they're not considering the problem, they're not considering what needs their users might have, which is a lot of you know, Silicon Valley startups have started from the point of view of technologists who are looking purely at that first question of what can the technology do? Oh, let's do that. That'll be good. Um, the second is when you consider the needs of your users, but you think they're all like you. So that's another problem that often comes up when you look at companies that have tended to be founded by uh, young upper middle class white men who are designing often for people who they assume are just like them with the same problems they have, but then get extended to a much, much wider set of participants and a much wider audience, and a lot of problems ensue because of that. Um, or the third is because your incentives are misaligned and you're not actually designing for your user. You're designing to achieve other things via the participation of your user, which I think we've all alluded to in one way or another. And so I think the question then, you know, we come back to what problem are you trying to solve? And I think in any of these cases, if you are trying to solve a real problem for people to help them do something better in their lives, then the methods by which you do that become something that fosters that end. So nobody is arguing about like whether Headspace should be using persuasive design to get people to use it every day and like, oh no, everybody's meditating all the time. This is really bad. Um, like that's not a problem because it's solving a real need for their users. And so I think that's <clears throat> what I want to come back to throughout this is like the nuance of it's not about whether the technology is bad or whether like persuasive design is bad, but about how it gets applied and what kinds of problems it's trying to solve. And then finally, like the how do you know if you've succeeded part? Um, you alluded to this about, about metrics and how problematic they are and that like we have a really narrow set of tools to understand uh, whether we're helping our users or not. And those tools tend to amount to like, is it more or less? Like, are they spending more time or less time? Are they clicking more or less? And that often doesn't get to the nuance of like, am I helping someone to be more informed? Um, are, do they have a clearer sense of what's happening in the world around them? Are they less anxious? Um, are they spending less time to get the information they need? All these questions are ones that we don't actually have the technological tools to answer accurately. And so I think part of the solution to that is to continue working on ways that we can actually quantitatively measure those things. And then the other piece is to keep talking to your users and to, and to balance out the qualitative and qu quantitative ways of measuring that so that you have a richer understanding of what the success or failure of your product is. Excellent. Well, I feel less anxious knowing that you were doing that as a loyal Axios newsletter subscriber. So when you mentioned Headspace, it reminded me of my favorite chart that I've seen this year, which is something Tristan put together. And it's a chart of the apps people use and how happy they are with it, right? And you look on one side, there's a whole bunch of apps that people spend, uh, that people are really happy with, like Evernote and Waze and Google Calendar. Everybody's happy they spend time in those apps. But they don't, they spend like five minutes. And on the right-hand column are all the apps that people are miserable with. And it's like Instagram, Facebook, you know, Reddit, where they spend hours. Headspace does very well. Anyway, Tristan, thank you for that chart and welcome. My question for you, 
How much of this, in a way, is about Trump? Because the reason, one of the reasons why these arguments are taken off is this underlying sense that the spread of misinformation, the spread of outrage, led to a candidate who was very good at making people very emotional and was a candidate who not a lot of people in Silicon Valley like. But what's also interesting is that the last time social media was able to really affect a presidential election and help a candidate who really inspired emotion, it was Obama. And so are we overcorrecting a little bit because of the outrage in Silicon Valley about Trump? Explain how you, how you think about that. <clears throat> so are we, are we overcorrecting? In that, like, well, how, how much of this do you think ties back to Trump? If Trump had not, clearly the campaign that you've helped start has massive momentum. Had Trump not won, do you think it would have as much momentum? And then secondly, do you think the same forces at play here are the same ones that kind of helped Obama be more of a viral candidate just in sort of a reverse way? Roger says no based no, on his facial yeah. expression. I think we agree that it's look-alike models. Fire away. There. So the look-alike models were introduced in 2013. 2013. So one of the key things that really changed is the introduction of look-alike models. How many people here know what look-alike models are? A very small number of people. I count like probably five, ten percent. So lookalike models let you say, I have an email list of a hundred people believing in a conspiracy theory. How do you do that? You go to one of the conspiracy theory groups on Facebook, you look at the user IDs, and you just download them. Then you pump that list of a hundred into Facebook and say, give me a million people who look just like that. Did you know you could do that with Facebook? Most people, including many folks in Congress, you know, you wouldn't know. These are new, sophisticated tools, and that was introduced in 2013. And that totally changes the dynamics of persuasion. I think of this as we just invented a new species of persuasion. Every time you open up Facebook, whether it's the content story you see on a news feed, or it's the ad that you see, we think that, you know, the story that shows up at the top is just the latest thing that one of my friends posted. But that's not what actually happens. When you open up that blue F icon, you just activated a supercomputer on the other side of the screen that's trying to play chess against your mind and figure out what's the move I can play 50 million steps ahead of your mind has any clue is coming. That's the perfect thing to show you that will keep you scrolling. The advertising engine is very similar. And so the one thing I think about this is that the thing that is changing is we are increasing, you could graph even, how powerful and how specific and how targeted and how um, micro-targeted the persuasion can be. And you can see that power increasing. And we're left with this, like human evolution 1.0, prefrontal cortex, like not changing. So as a friend of mine likes to say, it's like bringing a knife to a space laser fight. Or just think about Gary Kasparov, you know? It's like playing chess in the 1990s against a computer. First it's kind of fun, and it's like kind of difficult, and just beat it every time, and then it starts making these moves, and you like don't understand why it made that move, and three moves later it beat you, and you're like, that's interesting. And then Gary Kasparov plays this thing, and then once it beats him, it's just seeing way more moves ahead on the chessboard than all of humanity for all time, that point onward in the future. So the important part to realize here is that we have exponential tech combined with persuasion, and we're not changing this. And so the only way to solve this problem is to not have adversarial exponential tech. You don't want an AI in the opposite side of the table pointed at your brain or children's brains trying to say, how do I keep you hooked, or how do I get you the perfect targeted message? And I think that's the framing that encapsulates fake news, perfect political advertising, Cambridge Analytica, addiction. It's, this is the essence of the problem. Nir, is that the right metaphor, a knife uh, that we have and space lasers that uh, Facebook has? I would, so let me first start with a personal story that uh, I have felt the repercussions of technology that sucks you in. Uh, when I was writing my book, uh, I didn't have anybody calling me. There was no speaking engagements. And then once my book came out, I was very busy. Uh, I got lots of emails. Uh, my Facebook account was kind of exploding with different questions and stuff. And, and I got too much into this stuff. I wouldn't spend time with my daughter when I wanted to spend time with her. I would be distracted during the day. So 
I've, I've felt this problem deeply. And my friend Gretchen Rubin likes to say that research is me search. And so that's part of what drives my interest in this space. So I acutely feel this problem, and I'm, I'm even more sensitive to it because I have a nine-year-old daughter, uh, and I need to figure out how to help her manage technology. Now, I think where maybe we disagree, where our metaphors might disagree, is that I don't call it a space laser metaphor. Uh, I would use a space pen metaphor. And you probably, some of you know the story I'm about to tell. NASA spent millions of dollars trying to figure out how to make the space pen that could write in zero gravity. Right, millions of dollars to create a space that the, the, uh, a pen the astronauts could use in zero g. Meanwhile, the, the Soviets at the time used a pencil. So yes, there are supercomputers. And yes, there are people who are designing your behavior. But you have the pencil. <laughs> and so the message I don't want anyone to leave here with tonight is that they are powerless, that you live in an attentional serfdom. Because you know what? There is nothing Mark Zuckerberg can do if you took five minutes and changed your notification settings or uninstalled the app. Or I actually do put time on my calendar to use social media. I plan. I only use social media on my desktop every night after dinner. That's my social media use time. So it doesn't interfere with my day. These are techniques that take minutes and that they can't do anything about. I mean, I think that's, it, it's interesting because I, on the one hand, yes, that's true. We can turn these things off. And I think we have a sort of obligation to um, represent our own best interests in our actions. But at the same time, like a lot of these conversations do revolve around how kids do this. And if you talk to kids and you talk to teenagers, like the other thing, there's technology, there's design, there's sort of business incentives, and then there's social expectation. And so, uh, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine who was hanging around with a bunch of her younger cousins and their, um, their family environment, they were having a family gathering where it was the social expectation in the moment in person was that they should not be looking at their phones, that it was really rude to, that you put your phone away. And this was for several hours at a time. And the younger members of that contingent felt real social repercussions for having not been available during that time in terms of like it being problematic in their friendships if they stepped away. And so I think it's also how you, uh, how we teach social expectations, how uh, we align those around like what our better goals are. And I think that that is more problematic when you're talking about people who maybe have a different social environment than those of us who can maybe say, I'm gonna opt out and we're in a social environment where that's, that's the okay. The ability to manipulate people's sense of obligation to each other is at the root of what Snapchat does with streaks, which I hate to repeat this example, even though I already said it on 60 Minutes back in April. It's because if you really understand, and I think this, this also speaks to Nir's point, there is 100 million um, people who use Snapchat. Actually, I think several hundred million? I might be up, up not to the numbers. Um, there's hundreds of millions of, of probably teenagers, right, between the ages of 12 and 20-something who are using Snapchat. Um, and the streaks feature, how many people here use Snapchat or streaks? So it's even a small audience, okay. Or maybe you're just shy to put your hand up because you're worried about what I'm going to say. <laughs> using it right now. Yeah, right. There we go. Some pride um, in the middle. And the streaks feature shows the number of days in a row that you've sent a message to each one of your friends. Now, when Snapchat does that, so here's this company. It's based in... Venice, California, in LA on the beach. And it's run by some people who look kind of like me, like, you know, not quite like me, like more like, you know, LA based engineering dudes, bro, bro kind of types. And when they walk into the office and they're saying, what should we add to Snapchat next? Knowing that our audience is these like teenagers, do they step in there and say, gosh, what would, how would we enhance the meaning of friendship? <laughs> like to make it really good for people and really think about what it would mean. We're like the urban planners of the digital, in, of, the, of the new urban environment that people literally live in. Like what people miss, if you use text messaging or email as your number one communication app, like we live there. They live in Snapchat. They don't get a choice. And social expectations are mediated by this thing called streaks. And if you ask teenagers, if any of you are parents, you know that when you go on vacation, the kids tell you or tell their friends, you have to keep all of my streaks going while I'm away. 
they even call it, there's a name for it. They're called streaks managers. And I'm not kidding you. So like, while it's possible for adults to say, I'm going to turn off notifications, or while it's possible for you to tell your kids, why are you fiddling with this stuff? I want to live in a world where the defaults are good for everybody. And that's possible if companies like Apple and Samsung, who make the devices and are not incentivized by maximizing attention, change the entire thing from the ground up to ask how could we make defaults that structure these relationships, every single one, to be about serving humanity first. And we just launched the Center for Humane Technology today that's trying to push forward more of those ideas about what that could look like. So, fire away. So, I, well, first of all, I want to say that Tristan and I agree on 99% of, of what we discuss. Actually, I think one of your first large audience talks was at a conference I gave. I do this habit summit every year, and I invited you to speak because I, I, you know, I believe you, you speak about very important issues here. However, because I care about this industry so much and I care about what technology can do to improve people's lives, I want to make sure that we don't have a reefer madness moment. Right? I want to make sure that we don't freak out and lose our heads about the potential harm of technology so that we don't reap the potential benefits. And one of the things that we can do, I think, is look at the tactics versus the harm caused. So when we criticize something like streaks on Snapchat, that is a persuasion technique. It is designed to get users to do something. But did you know that's the exact same technique that Duolingo uses to teach you a new language? Right? The same thing that makes a product engaging, that makes it good, that makes it something fun, inherently, potentially makes it addictive to some people. Some people will overuse it. Some people will abuse it. Now, let's talk about kids. Kids are a protected class of people. Okay? I have a nine-year-old daughter. I love her very much. I would not let her walk into a bar and order a gin and tonic. I would not let her walk into a casino and play blackjack. I would not put her in front of the television for hours on end. She might watch Fox News. <laughs> so whenever we have any kind of medium that we are exposing children to, there are special measures that we need to take as parents and for product makers. And I agree. I think there's a lot that technology companies can do to make products safer for children. However, we also have to be careful of saying, you see these kids today with their rebelliousness using Snapchat all the time? Because we don't use it, and it's not meaningful to us, right? We watch the Super Bowl. We go to church. We watch too much TV. We do all these things that other people might think is not meaningful for them, but we think is meaningful. So we got to be very careful about judging people just based on how they spend their time. Because my hobby, my passion, what's meaningful for me is someone else's frivolity, particularly when it comes to people who spend time on social media and gaming. This rumor, that this, this perception that if you're a gamer, if you enjoy spending time on social media, that somehow you're defective, you're weird, you, you know, this, you're, you're, not, you're not having a, a, a real experience that's always harmful, you know, I think that's, that's, that's putting yourself on a moral pedestal, right? That, that, that saying that the way kids spend time is not meaningful. Not only that, I think it potentially obfuscates why they're spending so much time on social media, right? Before social media, when I was growing up, we used to get the finger wag about spending too much time watching TV, right? You don't be a couch potato. And the telephone, get off the darn phone. You're spending too much time on, on the phone, right? That's what probably most of you heard growing up. Well, today, when kids are so highly regulated, when they're told where to go, what to do, what to think, what to eat, how to dress, there's two places that you can have that kind of situation, school and prison. Of course they're going to look for some place to have some kind of agency, some kind of control over their lives. So yes, there are things that these companies can do. I think we should hold them accountable. I think there's a lot more that they can do to make shutting these things off easier. But we also don't want to forget the deeper issues. right? We don't want to forget the deeper issues of why people are using these products to the extent they are. I think that's something that we, 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 can't, uh, we can't forget. And so we, we need to just also remember, too, that we have to actually look at the information. There was an article about uh, in the Atlantic recently uh, that many of you saw about, is tech ruining a, a generation? How many of you saw that? That is tech ruining a generation, right? Turns out if you actually dig into the study of how technology causes depression in teenagers, that actual study, if you look at the, this was actually published in Wired. Thank you for publishing yes. this article. 
Uh, let me just quote real quick. They calculated that social media exposure could explain 0.36% of the covariance of depressive symptoms in girls, but those results did not hold for the boys in the data set. What's more, the 0.36% means that 99.64% of the group's depressive symptoms had nothing to do with social media use. One researcher quoted in the article gave his opinion that I have the data set right here in front of me, and I submit to you that based on the same data set, eating potatoes has the same extent, uh, has this exact same negative effect on depression that the negative impact of list, uh, on depression. So potatoes has just as much of a negative impact on depression as social media use. I've always been worried about potatoes. Right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. And in fact, the negative impact of listening to music, Roger, is 13 times larger than the effect of social media. Uh, not right. I know music. that for a fact. So <laughs> there you go. So I just think we need to be very careful about, it because I care about this, and it is an important issue, we don't want to make up stuff. We don't want to get, especially for journalism students. I know most of you here are journalism students. We have to check this stuff. We have to look at the studies. We have to look at the data to show what's really happening. Because if we tell people that they're powerless, that technology is hijacking their brains, you know what people do? They believe it. They believe it. And we know there was a study done on alcoholics that I found the switch number to Roger because he's going to hijack your brain in a second. Okay. That last quick point, then I'm, I'm done. The, we know that a study from alcoholics showed that when people, the, the number one factor that determined relapse among alcoholics is not the level of physical dependency, it's their belief in their own powerlessness. Not the physical dependency. We're talking about booze here. We're not something you ingest into your body. We're not freebasing Facebook and injecting Instagram, remember? Right? Your level of powerlessness, your belief that you can't do something, is more of a factor in how much you stay addicted. So we have to keep that in mind. So I just want to respond both to your question about Trump and a little bit to this a point that Nir just made. So the observation I would make is that social media has been a tool for undermining democracy around the world. It, you know, we've seen election interference in, I think, eight countries so far. There are at least three countries where there's election interference going on as we speak. There is still a Russian program going on in the United States. Um, so I look at this and I think that this is a special moment in time. Trump is one of the two successful campaign results and the assault on democracy makes this time unique i do think the obama thing is essentially completely different well let's let's skip the obama example then so social media certainly amplified all kinds of things in the trump campaign to use lookalike audiences extremely effectively but social media has also amplified I don't know. The Me Too movement has been massively successful in part through. Ag agreed, and I think, and this is where I would come to, to Nir's point. I think there are some really obvious tells for when social media. Look, my issue is not with social media per se. I, I I'm addicted to Facebook because I love the good aspects of it, and it, the issue for me is the incentives are wrong because of the way the advertising model works, and so it. It, le it creates the opportunity for people to exploit Facebook's exceptional tools and exceptional reach to do harm. And basically, it's the powerful doing harm to the powerless. And that's my real problem with it. And so when I think of things like Snapstreak and, and near this is a place we disagree, I think there are a bunch of really obvious places you got to be careful. I mean, if you look at whether it's YouTube Kids and the Google Chromebooks in elementary schools to get kids addicted. If you look at Facebook or Facebook's Messenger kids, these are not products in which you can make a case for any kind of likely positive outcome. And, you know, I look at them and just go, come on, there's, there, you got to draw some lines. And I look at snap streaks and I just go, you know, when you substitute something phony like a snap streak for a real relationship, that's probably not going to end well with young people. And I, I, I'm just, I look at these things, and I, I don't want to draw a lot of lines either, okay? I really believe in letting people make their own choices, but I do think that right now the profit motive is causing these people to systematically uh, attempt things that not everyone in society is prepared for, and they didn't tell us ahead of time that there was a risk, and so they got us addicted before we knew it. It was exactly like what happened with convenience food for the same things. Convenience has been substituted for, you know, vegetables, if you will, and, you know. Potatoes. I worry about that. And, yeah, well, that's the point, you know, and you got to watch out. Now I got to watch out for potatoes and music. I mean, this is going to be a really tough night. So I would agree with you about um, the profit motive, but also the, the pressure on the scale of that profit motive, because part of the problem with Facebook is not just that it's ad supported, but that it is under pressure to, to um, maximize that ad profit at a scale which is unfeasible, even given the biggest audience in the world. And they have to do things that are bad for 
your user experience in order to achieve that kind of scale. Um, the thing I wanted to push back on a little is like you were talking about, uh, I forget the two examples, Facebook Messenger for kids and, and, and saying like there's no way there's a positive outcome there. And I think that ties into what Nir was saying where it's like how do we evaluate what is positive and what is negative here? And there are a couple of things behind that. And one is what Nir was saying about kind of the framework of how we look at technology. Every new technology has produced a backlash about how that technology is going to destroy society. Um, common books were gonna destroy society because no one had to keep all the information in their heads anymore. Uh, the printing press was gonna destroy society for various other reasons, like this goes back through human history. And so, first of all, how do we separate out what is our sort of perspective on that. So there's a Douglas Adams quote that I'm going to horribly mangle that's like anything that happens before you're 18 is kind of the natural way of things and anything that happens between when you're 18 and 35 is like the greatest new invention and is the way of the future and anything that happens after you're 35 is like against the natural order and evil. And so would you be open to to actually running tests on the ones with kids. My only point here is I'm willing to allow that they're probably good use cases, but you might have an FDA kind of approach to this no, kind of thing. No, yeah, well, and, and that's kind of what I'm asking is so like there, there's one thing which is like, is like how do we assess what's positive? Because a lot of these conversations also happen in this kind of context, which is a very specific sociocultural context. Like we, we probably don't have the diversity of perspective that's necessary to really speak to who, like, what does good mean? What is a positive experience and who, for whom? Um, and so how do we make sure that there's like the right voices in the room to understand what the positive outcomes are and what the harm is and make sure that is not so tied to the perspectives and the voices of the people who tend to be the ones doing, having the conversations about this? So we're going to move to Q&A in a few minutes. The panel has run long, but no one has left the room and no one has kept up a snap streak during this panel, so we're doing well. Um, I love this panel because not only are they all so smart and it's so interesting, they're all so darn articulate. This is great. Um, I'm going to ask one more question before we go to Q&As, and it's something I've been wanting to ask. I'm going to ask you, James, but Tristan, you can answer it too. We've been talking about how these companies should reform and how they should do things differently. You have an organization called Time Well Spent. In the last, I don't know, 150 interviews that Mark Zuckerberg has given, he's talked about time well spent. He's like literally used the phrase time well spent. He's trying to orient, reorient Facebook towards time well spent. How does it make you feel to have him using your organization's name? Uh, and is he doing the right thing? And then after James answers this, let's go to Q&A, because I suspect there might be some questions in the room. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like you see a train going in the wrong direction. You tell the person driving it it's going in the wrong direction. And they say, OK, we'll all upgrade the brakes and renovate the interior and you know put some new shock absorbers on it. But it's still on the wrong track, still going in the wrong direction. <laughs> uh, you know, like the only the only solution to this is to have a different business model, a different set of incentives that incentivizes the right sort of design, design that is on our side, that is not adversarial against our interests. Um, anything else is just, you know, upgrading the shock absorbers on the trains. Is that a good metaphor? Yeah, J James is incredibly articulate. Um, I don't know if you mentioned, James and I met at Google after I made this presentation in 2013 about Google's moral responsibility in shaping a billion people's attention and how powerful we have the ability to persuade people's attention without even realizing it. And James is one of, I mean, there's a chorus of people who emailed, but James said, I get it, I get it. I've been studying persuasion and ethics at Oxford, and we both had this background in persuasive technology. And so it's actually really uh, fun to be here, what, five years later, uh, really incredibly, to be honest. Uh, and when we came up with this phrase, time well spent, James is in my hotel room uh, in, in uh, Brussels before we gave a TED talk and introduced that phrase, and four years later, using it. I think what's cool about it is it speaks to the fact that the movement for time well spent, which is the kind of the consumer movement of, of what we really want for technology to work for us, uh, is taking off such that Zuckerberg has to make that the name of what they're doing to fix it. They're looking for ways to kind of say, we're fixing the problem. And so they're, they're trying to patch that onto the top. But completely aligned with James, there's a reason why when New York Times asked, you know, nine experts how to fix Facebook, that Tim Wu, who wrote a great book called The Attention Merchant, said they should become a global public benefit corporation. Why is that important? Because James and I are both philosophers. When you think about ethical persuasion, the only way to have ethical persuasion is if the goals of the persuader align with the goals of the persuadee. Think of a parent and a child. Think of a psychotherapist and their client. Think about a teacher and their student. 
Where in society are the goals of the persuader, the influencer, most closely aligned with the goals of the persuadee? And, and that's the core issue as you get runaway persuasive tech. And so the real issue with streaks, to go back to that, isn't the technique. It's that the goals of Snapchat are so divergent from the goals developmentally of children at the ages of 12 to 14, which if you go back to Piaget and study theories of childhood development, we know something about where kids are at that stage and how vulnerable they are to the feeling of needing to get back to their friends. Otherwise, their friends won't think that they're friends with them. It takes a very delicate and compassionate perspective to get into these sensitivities. And so I think more than even just ethical persuasion is developmentally tuned, compassionate, careful, uh, listening persuasion, which is why these metrics don't work. Because when you're maximizing something, you're driving a train through two billion people's minds, and you're not listening except for what we're getting their lizard brain to do, right? So I'll just leave it at that. All right, so uh, lizard brains, please come to the microphones. Please speak into the microphones because we are being live streamed to 2 billion people also, and they want to hear your questions. So on the left. Hi there. My question is about the spread of system one. Sounds good. About the th spread of false and misleading information. And the other day I was helping a uh, friend and I looked on her Facebook wall and there was a story about the cell phones being placed on, like, uh, on a list that would enable people to telemarket to you. And there were a zillion signs to me that this was fake. The fonts were all messy. It was in all caps. It wasn't from the FTC. Like This was an old thing I knew to be wrong. And it was easy for me to go and say, how do we go, you know, delete this post, don't share it again. And then I come here and I come to a panel and we talk about stories that are false and we spread this NASA pencil story, which is not true. <laughs> um, and really? so if even the people who are experts in this area have trouble distinguishing what's real and what's not, how do we do better as a society, both online and out in the world, to m reduce the spread and the impact of these false ideas? All right, good question. Alexis, you want to? I mean, I think part of it, so I think one thing I'll say, and this goes back to one of these, like throughout human history, this has been true. Uh, people have been spreading misinformation for a really long time. It's not, there, there's a new vehicle for it with Facebook and with Twitter. Um, but this is not a new situation. Um, and in fact, it's something where I think it's, it's really only in sort of like the second half of the 20th century that you had this kind of unique situation where you had this like sort of band of trusted media outlets, at least in the US, that were kind of the, the, the firewall for factual information. And you know, even they didn't always get it right because people are human. But um, you had the set of reliable sources. And I think that that is the thing that we are feeling the loss of so much because of the flattening that happens with the internet, that you flatten not only the access to publishing, um, because everyone has access to the same tools, whether you are like the New York Times or like Joe Smith, um, and then also the flattening of how that information is presented, which is largely a thing that happens on platforms where you see Google and Facebook and Twitter will present something from Infowars like the same way as it would from the Wall Street Journal. Um, so I think there are a few different things that can happen there. Um, and some of it is about uh, journalists and people who do journalism as a profession um, being more transparent about what that means and what that why that is a service and why that is different from just somebody saying something on the internet because I think we've completely lost that. I think the majority of people don't understand how a journalist writing an article is different from just somebody saying something on the internet. So I think being more transparent about what journalism is and not just assuming that people have this collective cultural knowledge and semiotics that they don't have anymore. Um, and then part of it is on the platforms to start to uh, display those sources in different ways and that is tricky and problematic because, again, then they become the gatekeepers for what we see and what becomes um, a reliable source or not. But it's better than everything being flat. So I, I think that comes from a few different directions. All right. Yeah, I'll clap for that, too. Thanks, Alexis. All right. Uh, question number two. Um, 
Yeah, I guess it's a slightly smaller uh, event, if not a very small event. Uh, a couple of years ago, Amazon was actually fined, um, you know, peanuts, $50 million for essentially getting kids to, um, uh, perhaps unbeknownst to them, make in-app purchases. And it was later found out that parents of kids are probably as susceptible to it as, as kids are. I know, you know, discussion here today has been a lot around attention. Google and Facebook have kind of been the focal points of that conversation. But, you know, I, I'd like the panel to kind of consider, you know, the monetization model uh, for most uh, platforms, which ultimately boils down to uh, some level of commerce, right? And uh, are we equally in imminent danger uh, through these platforms to create, um, you know, a social structure where we are driven by impulse and instant gratification, and uh, you know, and and uh, you know, I'd also like to bring this back to how these companies got to uh, as big as they are now, uh, you know, over the course of the last uh, ten years. Um, which is what uh, a lot of people investing the capital, VCs, mm -hmm. like to see, which is tremendous growth in users. Whether, the, whether it's actually solving a problem, uh, you know, having founded a startup myself um, and having presented to VCs seems to matter, matter less as much as the metric of, hey, how many users do you have? How many times have they really engaged? Whether it's actually performing a positive social function and outcome uh, doesn't seem to matter. Roger, you want to take this one? You're a, I don't know, but anybody can take this. You're the VC here, man. <laughs> First of all, I think your criticism of investors is right on target. I think that you know, people take the easy way out. And uh, you know, in the late 90s, a set of metrics got invented to justify the internet bubble. And it got people conditioned to this notion that you could invent your own metric. And you know, people got really good at that. And the fact that these things ultimately became very valuable seemed to make, seemed to provide a justification for that. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't like it any better than you do. That's why I stopped investing professionally. I'll say to Roger's behalf that he had the chance to invest in many big successful tech companies and chose not to because of his values, because he actually has values. And um, specifically Uber, Spotify, and Twitter. And uh, I mean, it just, you know, you got to draw a line somewhere. And I was turning down so many obvious when people valued things that I didn't believe in, in a way that I just said, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. And your values are only as good as your denial because most people just sort of cancel out the part they don't want to see in their own mind, right? I should add Zynga, too. That was the one that started. Yeah, Zynga, yeah. Um, but I, what, what, another place I'll go in this, which I said on Sam Harris's podcast, is um, you know, if you're designing a city, you have zoning laws. You don't just say, let's just eke out every dollar from every square inch of every part of the city, turn everything into commerce, put billboards everywhere, you ask, because we have to live inside of that thing, what makes a great city great, livable? What makes it safe? What makes it feel warm? What makes it feel like I can connect with strangers on the street? What makes people feel like they can hang out? Jane Jacobs in Green Greenwich Village like thought about all these questions. And Apple and Google, we were talking about technology, are kind of like the urban planners of this digital environment. And they could kind of say, these are the parts that are the residential zones. These are the kids' zones. This is how we protect you know, sleep. This is how we protect when you're trying to focus and do some work and not let these other people in. This is, there's a lot of ways to think about this. And we invent structures in society like the EPA or other things to say, hey, hands off. These are parts that are about humans. And we try to do that. Or you have values and you do it yourself by segmenting that in your own mind. All right. So it looks like we have many, many questions. Um, so I don't know. Let's limit them to Snapchat length. Um, so you got 10 seconds for a question and then the answers. I don't know. Let's limit them to 280 characters. <laughs> Fire away. We, uh, Nir, you were talking about how this is sort of like us just sort of gossiping on the telephone when we were younger. Um, I'm just sort of curious to the, uh, the opposing side of that of why it's different this time um, and why it's not the same sort of why we're not Luddites by being afraid of this. 
I'm curious for Tristan's answer and his response. Great. Sure. Neo, you first. Me first? Okay. Uh, and I, I wanted to thank the last person for uh, helping me with this new information about the space pen. I, it was a response. That I, it was great that we had that conversation and you educated me that that wasn't uh, a real story, apparently. And I think part of the solution for misinformation is more conversation, right? And I think that's part of, uh, of, of the solution. Um, when it comes to what's different about this phase of technology uh, is that, well, there's a lot of things that are different. I think the ubiquitous nature of technology today, the fact that um, you know, to get to uh, a telephone was something that used to only be in your home. Before that, it was one, every, you know, one in every town. Now it's in everybody's pocket. Uh, the fact that we can use these products uh, anytime, any place, and at faster speeds than ever before makes us pass through these hooks uh, so to speak, faster. And so therefore, the habit-forming potential of these products increases. Um, we, we do want to not forget, though, that there is an incentive, though, uh, to not piss people off, right? The fact that, you know, the, the study that you guys did around um, which products make you happier versus less happy, we see that in Facebook's numbers, right? As, as habit-forming as Facebook is, as, you know, uh, hijacking of the mind as it is, you know, the average person spends 30 minutes a day on Facebook, according to Facebook. The average American spends five hours a day on television. So we can't forget that there's all kinds of distractions out there, not just Facebook, not just the latest one. And the 30 minutes for the vast majority of people is a manageable amount of, of use. Now, what they've also uh, shown us over the past, I think it's, Roger, you can correct me on this, I think five quarters, people are spending less time on Facebook. Did you know that? that the longer you use Facebook, the less you use it. So maybe Mark Zuckerberg is making all these changes because of ethical responses to a movement. Maybe he's doing it because people think Facebook sucks, right? And if you think Facebook sucks, I encourage you to not use it. I'm not an advocate of Facebook. I've never worked for Facebook. I don't use Facebook other than this portion time of day. And so we all have to figure out when do these products serve us and when are we serving them just as much as we would serve the television set or serve other frivolities in our life that, that don't serve us. But I think the incentive is that if there is too much crap on your Facebook feed, if, there, if the product is not fun to use, if it's not making you better off, you know what most people do? Not right away. It might take them a little bit. But we're all starting to see this cultural movement of putting it away because it's not good for us. We don't like it. And so people use it less and less. I know there's a lot of questions. I'll just say there's four uh, major things that make this time different from other times. I think this is actually a moment where we just invented the atomic bomb. It blew up. And we're trying to say, well, we've always had bombs, and bombs always explode. And so like, maybe there's nothing to worry about. There are some times when quantitative differences make completely qualitative and categorical differences. We have never had a two billion person civilization scale mind control machine where the engineers who made it, 50 people in California, are shaping thoughts in places that they don't even speak the language, aka Burma, creating genocide where 300,000 Rohingya are crossing across the border to Bangladesh. And how many engineers at Facebook speak Burmese? Now, I'm not trying to pick on Facebook for this. I'm saying they're actually in a very hard position. But just to ground the consequences here, because you, know, you can get in debates about persuasion and stuff, but there's very serious human consequences because we've created exponential tech that's maximizing for one goal and it has exponential consequences <coughs> without exponential sensitivity, ethics, compassion, awareness of what the hell it's doing. So as one of my friends likes to say, it's like we have the power of gods without the wisdom, prudence, and compassion of gods. And the people who made it need to admit that this is the structure of the problem. But on top of that, I want to say we've also never had persuasion that manipulated our social relationships. And that's what is so dangerous about Snapchat is it manipulates the currency of whether or not I believe I am or I'm not friends with someone. And the thing about time spent, the other critical thing there is it's not about the time and the duration. It's about the frequency and the sort of way that it displaces other choices we would have liked to have made. It's because it's so instantly available that you do this one thing for 10 minutes and it becomes 30 minutes and then now it's 8.30 and then I didn't text my friend and so now I'm alone for the rest of the night, right? That sequence is totally different than previous times in history. Thousand engineers. Um, next question. 
Hi, thanks everyone for coming out. I really appreciate this conversation. Um, my question is a little bit um, about the hardware, actually. Um, I want to address a story that happened to me two years ago that's probably happened to almost everyone here. Um, I just moved to Brooklyn, and I was on the subway, and my phone died, um, and I didn't know how to get off or go where I needed to go. Um, and I looked around me, and everyone on the subway had earbuds in their ears. Um, and at that moment, I noticed that the entire subway cart was completely unapproachable. And I wonder, um, and I'd love to hear um, what your thoughts on this are, if we can unlearn these kind of ill patterns that have been inherited and rooted into the way that we kind of perform in the world today. Another great question. Fire away. So I remember when I was growing up in the 1980s, we had cigarette a tray, ashtrays all over our house, ashtrays everywhere. Um, my parents didn't smoke, but we had them because people expected that when you came over, you were going to light up and you needed to have an ashtray there because it was bad manners if you, know, you didn't have one. And then that all changed, right? Then we had this new social norm that if you're going to smoke, you, you got to go outside. And I think we're going to see the same thing, that it is becoming, so I used to teach at Stanford, the Graduate School of Business, the Design School there. And I saw this, this switch happen over the years that I, I worked there that People, uh, the kids specifically, the younger they were, the better their tech manners were around each other. They even have words for it, right? They have like, you know, don't fub me, right? They know that this is something you're not supposed to do. So it's rude to be using your device in the middle of a meeting or a social gathering. We're starting to create new mores, new norms, new manners for this new technology. So I think that's a big part of it is, is the, you know, one, calling folks out, right? So I have this uh, tool I use that if we're sitting around the table and somebody decides to use their phone, I just say, hey, is everything okay? To get them to snap out of it. Hey, you know, join the conversation. Is everything okay? And they know what they're doing, right? They know they shouldn't be on their device. So I think we need these new manners, these new norms around how we use technology. Great. Let's go to go to the next question. Hey, y'all. Uh, two quick things. Uh, first one is that I think when we say Facebook, uh, we haven't really mentioned that we're also talking about Instagram and WhatsApp, which is owned by Facebook. And we're also talking about people, like all of the services that require Facebook to log in. So that's Tinder. Uh, so Facebook is not Facebook. Facebook is Tinder. It's Instagram. It's WhatsApp. Uh, financially as well as like just from an engineering API perspective, if you're launching a company off the ground, you want to have quick single sign-in integration. Um, but I think another thing that's I think a little bit more interesting to me is that so the original marketing for the Apple Watch was actually like this will get you off your phone. Like this, this will actually help you spend less time on your phone. So it's really great in this way. And, and we're, we're, we're selling uh, a distractionless or a less distracted life as a luxury product, right? So that, that's kind of a funny thing. And I think for me, that gets into like the entire rhetoric of solutionism and the critique of like looking at a lot of like social problems as problems that can be technologically articulated in the first place, much less technologically solved. And I think that that's kind of haunting us. And I think that like traditionally, one of the ways that we've managed to solve those impasses within, biz within the business world is with like external legislation. I think that that's possible in Europe. But I think that looking at what's happening in the States the last year, the, the, basically the political situation we have in Washington, what, what are the legislative or the non-legislative uh, approaches to solving this sort of like solutionist impact for even the possibility of less distraction is sold as a luxury product. James, you want to hit that? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think one way to think about this, this is a kind of kind of very broad, historical, kind of philosophical way to think about it, is that for most of human history, if we've lived in environments of information scarcity, um, the role of information technologies has been to kind of break down the barriers between us and information. Um, now, as Herbert Simon pointed out in the 70s, you know, we, we live in an environment of information abundance. And I think in a way this inverts what information technology ought to be doing. It's not there to break down the boundaries between us and information because it's all coming at us you know, always, all the time. I think its role is to be a filter. So I think this causes us uh, to, to re-examine sort of the existential purpose of various systems like news or advertising. Right? What are they for in an information uh, abundant world? Uh, if the historical justification had always been to, to bring us information that helps us make better decisions in a similar way, I think I probably wouldn't be so quick to dismiss all of the the the, the kinds of technological 
uh, kind of fixes here as solutionism. So for instance, there's something, uh, Bose has a type of headphones called the, called the Bose earphones, I think, where uh, if you're sitting at a table across from a person in a noisy room, it will block out everything apart from what you're sort of looking at or what you're focusing on. So, so I think it's, it's sort of this move of technology uh, from breaking down the barriers between us and information to sort of helping us filter out this field of information coming at us so that we can understand uh, and give attention to what matters. I, th I think that's that's kind of a, it's a very sort of you know thirty thousand foot way to describe what you're talking about. But but I, I think I think there is something uh, fundamental here that, that uh, about the kind of the redefinition of what information technology ought to be doing uh, that we haven't really yet internalized uh, either at the level of industry or or government or individual human lives. Um, I think that the the Bose example is a really good one because it gets back to that question of like what problem are you solving and for whom? And that identifies a very clear problem statement about what it's trying to do. And the thing that I worry about in the backlash to what we perceive and or identify as like the addictive uh, technologies and kind of persuasive design behaviors that um, these various platforms we've been talking about engage in is I worry about the same kind of solutionist approach being taken to solving those problems as created those problems in the first place. And I don't necessarily mean from a technological standpoint in that or applying technology to it, but from the standpoint of like, I've identified this problem from my own perspective. I'm not sort of like checking to see if that perspective is valid from a lot of different angles. And then like, I'm gonna propose a palliative solution to this. Um, and I think like it's that kind of mentality of like, uh, a few people identifying a problem and then saying, this is how we go about fixing it, that kind of led to those problems. That's the kind of mentality that led to those problems in the first place. And so I think that as we identify these problems, and that's kind of why I was asking before, like how do we know what positive outcomes are and for whom, and like how do we make sure there are lots of different kinds of perspectives in that conversation is really important in terms of like not taking the same kind of sledgehammer to solving those problems that, that built them. Thanks. I'm going to start taking a sledgehammer to questions, unfortunately, because we have 10 questions in 10 minutes. So fire away with quick questions and quick answers. Um, okay. Hi, uh, my name is Jenny. I just finished a degree in computer science. And I'm hoping to go back to school uh, for a PhD in psychology, uh, especially in child and uh, adolescent development psychology to see how technology is affecting, affecting development, because I'm really concerned for the next generation. So recently, Apple just uh, their stakeholders, some of their stakeholders released a letter uh, urging them to uh, change the parental controls so that the parents can better control uh, their children's usage of like their iPads and you know, Apple devices. And I've also heard that some schools in California, or there's been like new schools in California that have been uh, limiting you know, device uses in the classrooms and some parents are opting to send their children to those schools instead of the schools that don't limit device usage. So. Um, my question is about, I'm just, I want to ask about your thoughts about like millennials as parents. So like millennials were my generation, were the last generation to kind of grow up without, you know, a phone constantly in our hands. And so I kind of want to ask in the future, do you see kind of like a divide between like when the millennials who think that, you know, their children should not be using devices and the millennials who th still think that it's fine you know, for their children to use devices? And do you see like more popping up, of, uh, popping up, popping up, of these schools that um, you know are limiting devices, and what you think millennials and their habits will be as parents. Great. Who wants to take that one? Someone with maybe a three-week-old child <laughs> want to give that one a go? My regret this, but I mean, so I have a three-week-old son, and and I don't know how I'm going to approach. Uh, the deployment of technology with him because I don't know who he's going to be and or what the technology is going to be like when he's of age to use it. Um, increasingly, I'm of the opinion that the current forms of technology we have now, it's, it's a bit too late um, to really make the kinds of changes to do the kinds of research that we need to do. Um, I think this conversation is the sort of conversation we ought to have been having 10 years ago uh, to really make the kind of change we need to make. I think that doesn't mean that doing research into these forms, into these systems is, is not useful because, you know, who knows the direction technology will go. But, but I think, um, you know, I think 
looking to the next sort of generation of, of devices, which, you know, it seems to be these kind of natural language interfaces like Google Home, Amazon Alexa, um, which open up entire new vistas of persuasive power. Uh, and, you know, I think this is probably where I would be giving my attention right now, uh, as opposed to social media, so-called social media platforms uh, or smartphones. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, that's not to say they can't be redeemed. I just think that uh, to, do a, to do things right with technology uh, kind of guidance, we've got to leapfrog kind of the status quo and, and really, uh, you know, start to uh, engage with the technologies at, at, the, at the moment of their uncritical adoption, which is happening now with these new voice-first uh, interfaces. So I would also, oh, go ahead. Uh, I would also just say that I think the technology that even kids are using now, it's like so far from the kinds of social media engagement that we talk about here and that we're familiar with. Like you see all these weird niche apps where people are like creating, like designing video games and playing them with each other on the fly with like live chat and like social apps that pop up for like five months and then go away. Like it, it seems like there's <clears throat> a movement away from the kind of all dominating platform that everyone uses, or hopefully maybe a movement away from that into a lot of these much more uh, niche communities and areas of interest. And like, that's the thing that makes me feel really hopeful about what the next generation that's coming up is gonna do is that I think that there's a lot of interesting possibility and a lot of ways that they use technology and the internet that'll be super far from the kinds of addictive behaviors we're talking about here. Which doesn't make this not a concern, but like I think there's place for hope too. The one thing I would just say is the two areas I would encourage everybody to go into a debate. One is driverless cars, where we're ignoring all the history of transportation in the way the the things are being designed, and also artificial intelligence, where we're literally going contrary to every science fiction book ever written. <laughs> I, just, I want to add just one tiny extra thing. We. Um, uh, um, we just announced a partnership with Common Sense Media today, which is the number one uh, nonprofit setting the curriculum in 50% of U.S. schools. And uh, Jim Steyer, who's the president, uh, we're doing a whole bunch of work on specifically creating mass awareness campaigns. So if you're interested in that, you can Google it. It's called The Truth About Tech Campaign. We're actually about to go to D.C. on Wednesday and host a conference. So. I have three little boys, and I just gave the oldest one his first unfiltered access to Google for the first time in life, where he actually got to Google things in a room without his parents looking. So then I checked the logs the next morning. And it was all, Tesla, how big Tesla battery? How to get parents buy Tesla? How fast Tesla? Tesla 060. Anyway, next question. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> I know. Hey, so my question is also about, like, uh, along the lines of privacy. Um, so we've talked about, like, the dark side of design, and we focus on, like, Facebook and Google and social media. But I was wondering, like, looking, like, 12 months out, uh, like, what, publications like Axios and uh, Wired are talking about right now are things like, you know, speakers and Amazon Alexa and Google Home. So there are like 38 million speakers right now in like American homes. And I mean, I've myself been playing around with like their APIs and like building skills for it. And it's extremely easy. Like you can do it without programming. So people have like untapped access to like, you know, millions of American homes, potentially with like the same or worse impact uh, than like Facebook is having. I wonder where are your thoughts on that? Uh, seeing like those are like the things that we should probably be focusing in the next, you know, year or two. Lexus one, fire away. I mean, I think when you talk about privacy, that um, individual publishers probably have, when you talk about engaging with massive platforms like Google and Facebook, we have limited control over how they design their platforms. We have some control over how we use them. Um, we have more control over our own platforms and how we let third parties engage there. It's something that we've been actually very strict and conscious about at Axios in terms of um, having very strong limitations on any kind of third party data collection about our users on our site. And it's something where we uh, have that conversation like with our advertising partners and it's a really like mutually beneficial relationship where our uh, Use our audience is built on the trust that they have for us, and that trust is what makes us a platform that both readers and advertisers want to be on. And so we're trying to think about privacy as a way that we help to maintain and reinforce that trust. Let's do one more question. 
Yeah, I, I, just, I have a different kind of question. I'd just like to throw it out to you. A lot of very well-known, respected people have said, children are life's most valuable resource. Like, I'm getting back to the value of early childhood education of a startup called Eye Openers Are Mind Openers. And my question is, I, after the Board of Ed told me no three times, I always wanted to ask inner city five-year-olds questions, have them ask each other about life that adults have problems with. What's a good friend? Why do people like cheat and fight? So I finally did. And these kids humorously say, no adults left behind. And, uh, you know, with these things that you hear about Sugata from these TED Talks, about kids that are completely uneducated, when they're curious and emotionally engaged, end up doing astounding, amazing things. I'm just wondering, as a resource and a reality, is there any way that social media could sort of like make a contribution to that or what might be the problem? You know, anything. I never thought of this before. Um, you know what? Since we only have two minutes left, let's get the last two questions. Just ask your questions and then uh, we'll do a quick answers and then we'll wrap it up. So um, let's hold that one for a second. And do you want to come to the mic and ask your questions and then we'll um, pack it in and start drinking? Hi. Um, very quick question, which is, a lot of this is a big problem with uh, the advertising models that we're tied up in and the investor models that we're tied up in. So what are the business models that you're seeing successfully dis and disentangle themselves from the advertising revenue and selling data revenue that they're getting? Um, like, cause, and Tom, and uh, Roger, if you want to have your direct line to Mark, I would happily pay $20 a month to Facebook if they would, if they would stop selling my data. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we have, how far does that line go? I can't see. Oh, All right, we can, we can do this. We got one minute, yeah, fire okay. away. Uh, mine's kind of related to the conversation about Apple Watch. Do you feel that with the evolution of kind of Internet of Things and kind of this technology that's supposed to pull us away from our phones but instead be in our walls and in, you know, other parts of our life, is that something, a movement that's helpful in helping us maybe engage more with our environment or is that something that's just going to make this addictive te technology more addictive? Good questions keep coming. All right. So my question is about addiction and habit. Um, my understanding of the difference between habit and addiction is the presence of reward. Um, you get rewarded um, with brain chemicals um, for addiction for preferring behavior. And for a habit, um, you don't get the um, reward for preferring a behavior. And so do you agree with this definition? And if you do, um, how do you form a habit um, when there's no reward response for performing the behavior. Okay, and then last one. Uh, so this is for everyone, but uh, near, I think specifically, you mentioned that um, you know you want companies to be using this persuasive technology for good. Um, so what do you say to tech companies that are say trying to raise money, but most venture capitalists are still looking at these traditional you know uh, metrics that aren't aligned with the um, with what's good for consumers. So what do you say to them? All right, so we have questions about education, the business models, habits, and um, aligning everything. So I don't know, let's just zip through and give one final thought on one of those questions, and then we'll be done. Tristan, you got the mic. You want to do the business model one, Roger? Yeah, we're at time for it. Okay, sorry. Uh, so wait, we got education. You got education, you got the business models, you got habits, you got addiction, you got watches. Right. Um, I will say that uh, th there's something that, there's a couple of neuroscientists I know have been studying this, that there's something very powerful about a immediate visual display. You know, your eyes are your, a very dominant form of sensory perception. So having your full attention preoccupied by a screen is much more persuasive than if you subtract visual displays. And conversational interfaces, even though there's lots of privacy problems and ubiquity problems and things like that, um, you know, if you talk to design theorists like Paul Pangaro, who we actually used to talk with here in New York, and uh, Hugh Deverly, who was one of the original uh, guys at Apple, a design theorist, uh, conver design is co about conversation. When you're in a conversation, you're able to sense more about what's really going on for someone. And uh, technology right now is not in conversation with you. If it is in conversation with you, it's in conversation with your lizard brain and with whatever like manipulates your quick responses. And I think that the power of pause, think, reflect, answer is a different loop. And I think we should think about the loops that exist between us and technologies and which form factors encourage the better parts of ourselves and which ones encourage the worst parts of ourselves. So to the, uh, to the question of business model, which actually also goes to privacy, um, 
I think that for Facebook, the really obvious thing to do is to go to a subscription model. Right now, they do uh, about $82 a year in the United States in revenue per person, so you need about $7 a month to break even. I think the right strategy for them is to become literally like the cable television company for over the top. So they, that allows them to align their interests not just with the users but also with content providers because they can have separate channels for every single content. You could subscribe to other things the way you would in cable television. They can create bundles. That would get everybody aligned. And to the dude who asked the question about privacy. My one observation is every one of these new things has a business model that is fundamentally oppositional to the person who is buying the product. So whether this is Amazon with Alexa or any of these things. So they have enormous incentives to use your private information in ways that you may not be aware of. And in the era where we've had the Equifax hack, that is incredibly dangerous. You may not perceive that as dangerous today, but there will be a day when you don't want to do that. Personally, what I do is I play a game of avoiding Google. The convenience of Google is so intense, it's really hard to do, but I treat it like a video game. Can I avoid Google for like a day at a time, then two days at a time, then a week at a time? So it's like inverted addiction, but it's really addictive. <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in on these? Near? Or? Yeah, I think um, we also see an, a huge potential opportunity. The gentleman asked about new business models. We're, we're seeing a an explosion of companies that are building what I call attention retention devices, right? There are so many products today, most of them free, which are made specifically to help you manage distraction, right? There's YouTube DF, which takes out all the ads and, and uh, videos on YouTube, so you just watch the one you want to see. There's the Na Facebook Newsfeed Eradicator, which is completely free, which scrubs out your newsfeed. Um, there are companies using persuasive technology, the gentleman asked about business models, which have nothing to do about monetizing your data or uh, your, your, your eyeballs. Companies like Seven Cups of Tea, full of persuasive design that helps people connect with psychotherapists for free. Kahoot, which helps use variable rewards to make education more engaging. Uh, we talked about Duolingo, Bite Foods, a company I invested in that helps solve the problem of food deserts by getting people habituated to healthy food distributed in uh, vending machines as opposed to just more junk. So what I don't want you to do is to think that we're going to throw out the baby with the bathwater, and if something persuades somebody uh, or uses one of these techniques, then it has to be evil. That's not true. There is so much we can still do with technology to improve people's lives. I'm not an advocate for these technologies that we talked about, specifically these companies and, and, and how they do bad things in certain ways. They absolutely do, right? There is no way you can be a company of that size and not screw up. These companies are teenagers, right? They're just little kids. They've just grown up in terms of the number of years they've been around. And it is up to us to be careful consumers and put them in their place. But we cannot give up. We cannot, you know, despair is the first step to defeat. If we say, oh, they're all a bunch of seisters and these techniques are horrible and they're all hijacking our brains and there's nothing we can do about it, we've already lost. Alexis? Um, I'll just jump in on what Tristan was saying about uh, ubiquitous technologies. And I think that it actually gets back to the first point I made, which is what can the technology do? What problem is it solving? For whom? And how do you know if it works? Because these technologies can do a lot of things. And I think from a user experience design standpoint, the thing that you do is you interrogate, like, what does this technology particularly afford that a different one doesn't? So with conversational interfaces, you had this uh, you know, 18 months where that was the trend where everyone was like, oh, I know, we'll shove it into a bot, and that'll be the future. And then you slowly have people learning, like, what are the actual affordances of a conversational interface? What's it good for? What does it enable? What things does it enhance and what does it detract from? And I think once you start interrogating new technologies in that way and understand what kinds of problems they might be good at solving, then you can design much better experiences for people that actually solve those problems well. James? Sure. So I guess briefly on uh, the business model question and the addiction question. Um, I think it's time for us to talk seriously about the abolition of advertising, at least the sort of advertising that seeks to wantonly capture and exploit people's attention. Um, as Thomas Paine said in Common Sense, a long habit of thinking a thing, uh, long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives us a superficial appearance of being right. I think our informational, our media environment has changed uh, so profoundly that um, advertising ought to be seen as the affront to human dignity and freedom that it is. Um, on the point of addiction, I think. I would just encourage everyone in this audience to, when they go to events and listen to 
talks panels with Smart, ask, you know, why, why is addiction out of all the moral, ethical harms that technology design, persuasive design can cause, why is addiction the one that's seized on? Um, I think it's because it's convenient to those who want to defend the status quo. Uh, I think there's an implicit rhetorical move that happens when clinical thresholds become moral thresholds. Uh, when uh, the threshold of addiction in particular is uh, so high, uh, set so high and set so vaguely uh, that, um, that uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's hard to say what counts uh, and what doesn't. But in reality, that's, you know, one sliver in a broad visible spectrum of moral harm. Uh, and so I think while uh, the question of addiction and, and compulsion, broadly speaking, is extremely important, uh, it is just one slice of the broad uh, the broad world of, of moral harm that comes from persuasive design. So. Uh, that's a wrap, folks. So let's applaud again, actually.